Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today, I am delighted to talk to Dr. Abdullah Rothman. You are most welcome, sir. Thank you. Good to be here. Great, great to have you. Uh, Dr. Abdullah Rothman is a psychologist and the principal of Cambridge Muslim College here in England. He holds a PhD in psychology from Kingston University in London. His clinical practice, as well as his academic research, focus on approaching counselling and psychotherapy from within an Islamic paradigm and establishing an Islamic theoretical orientation to human psychology that's grounded in the knowledge of the soul from an Islamic tradition. In addition to his academic training, he has studied privately with a number of traditional Islamic scholars throughout the Muslim world. So today, Dr. Abdullah has kindly agreed to introduce us to this fascinating subject of Islamic psychology. So could you perhaps explain to us exactly what is Islamic psychology? Sure, I can, I can try to encapsulate it. It's, a, it's a, obviously a, a big topic and it's something that has become a, a sort of hot topic uh, as of late in the past few years where it's getting a lot of attention. And mm. because of that, it is, in some ways we can say it's a new field and in other ways we can say it's a very old field. Mm. And um, there tends to be some confusion and lack of clarity on people understanding or agreeing on what we're referring to when we say Islamic psychology. Mm. But I think where that stems from, ironically, perhaps, is more in the word psychology than it is in the word Islamic, in the mm. sense that, you know, uh, for the most part, people, when they think of psychology, we're thinking what we're taught in the Western academia. If you were to take a course on psychology, you'd be uh, studying a field that sort of started in the 18th century uh, and that is about the the study of the mind and behavior, right? So it's really defined as the study of mental processes and behavior. Um, but I think when we put the word Islamic in front of it, what we're what we're talking about is from the ontological and epistemological framework. So the assumptions that we that we make based on the worldview that the Quran posits, how do we understand the human being? And therefore, how does that inform our understanding of the trajectory of the human being, both understanding the nature of a human being and the process of, of change and how we make sense of difficulty, psychological problems or imbalances. And so, what we're looking at is more, I would say, what the words psychology actually means. Mm. Which, you know, the Greek, it means the study of the psyche, and the psyche is really the soul. So it's the study of the soul. Right. Uh, and we have, from before even the Western Academy has been talking about and dealing with psychology as a field, we have had in the Islamic tradition, uh, ilm nafs, which is essentially the Arabic uh, for the same term, study of the soul. Um, and so when we look at it from that perspective, we're then understanding, well, what is the soul mm. from an Islamic perspective? Yes. And from that perspective, it is much more than just mental processes and behavior. So mm. I think it zooms out and looks at these big, big concepts like epistemology. How do we know what we know, right? How do we, how do we um, understand what we count as knowledge? Mm. And that has a lot to do with, you know, then it starts to unravel and, on, and look at um, the, the conventional approach to psychology tends to be limited to the scientific paradigm, which is, really focused on what can be seen and measured. Right. And so this is why the focus tends to be on behavior and cognition, because these are things that are much easier to um, understand and study and look at the causes of these things from a mm. sort of materialist perspective without really taking seriously 
the unseen world, right? right? So recognizing knowledge that comes from things that we can't understand unless without revelation, essentially. Right. So, I mean, what in Islamic psychology, what is the human soul or where is it located? You mentioned the unseen and you mentioned the Western emphasis on the empirical, the observable, the empirically testable. But where, where is it and what, what does it consist of? If that's a, a yeah. question we can even address. Yeah, I can address it. And, and it's not as straightforward because like many things, when we deal with this thing that is unseen and, and esoteric and and you can't measure it, then what we get to into the world of um, a lot of trying to understand something. And from, from the Islamic tradition, we're, we're looking to the Quran and the, the prophetic tradition mm -hmm. to understand what we, what we know or piece together of the soul. And so some of that can remain uh, ambiguous, sometimes even secretive. And then you get a lot of different um, mm. uh, different opinions or different positions or maybe even um, disagreements from different schools of thought, right? Mm. But I would say when we're speaking of the sort of majority of scholars um, and the ones who have really spent the most time unpacking and understanding the nature of the soul, for instance, in the field of Islamic psychology, um, uh, Al-Ghazali is, is referenced quite a lot. Yeah. And the reason for that is because he did so much writing on really understanding, A, the um, sort of esoteric aspects of the exoteric um, parts of the Islamic tradition, of the, of the deen, of the religion. Mm -hmm. And through that, then really elucidating this, this um, unseen reality or substance of the soul. And so what... Mm -hmm. um, Al-Ghazali, but also many other scholars even before him and after him so, who sort of align and agree with this is that the soul is often referred to with these four terms of nafs, aql, kalb, and ruh. And often the, the nafs is interpreted as self. Some people say lower self, and I'll, I'll explain that in, in a minute. And then ruh, which is often translated as spirit, mm. and aql, which is translated as intellect, and kalb, which is the heart. Mm -hmm. And so it can get rather confusing with all these terms, and we can start to think, and what we, what we tend to do, and this is sort of, you know, um, illustrative of why we get stuck in, well, are we talking about the Western psychology of materialism or are we talking about this unseen world is we, we tend to want to reduce things and understand things in separation right so we're having these elements of the of the human being and we tend to think of them as separate things mm. whereas what we learn from the from the quran and the scholars elucidating this is that really it's one thing. So particularly Ghazali talks about these four terms and he sometimes uses them interchangeably. Right. Right. So you'll be, he'll be talking about the, the soul and he'll be using the word ruh and then he'll um, talk about a correlation to that, uh, the kalb, like that, that what he really means is the kalb. Mm. Uh, and so it can get, it can get confusing, but I think what, what helps um, bring it into focus is if we try to understand from the perspective of what we have come to know as psychology, where we have this notion that we, the self is this independent being, and we hear terms like the ego, and we have terms um, like our thoughts are become who we are, right? This is something that sort of, when you study psychology, the assumption is there's this notion that we are our thoughts, consciousness is in the mind, mm -hmm. um, right? And so what an Islamic perspective does is it, is it includes many more elements than just thinking and thought as the definition of consciousness and, and self-identification. Right. And the main distinguishing feature is the concept of the ruh. Right. The ruh is this... Um, 
you know, we know that the that Allah breathed into the human being from His uh, spirit, the the ruh, and this is what gave us um, life. Mm. And this ruh, so in the Quran, the ruh is referenced as something pure, mm. something that is not um, is not uh, corrupted and, and cannot be corrupted. But then when the nafs is referred to, even though the nafs is also something that is beautiful and has uh, has the ability to be elevated, it also is something that can be corrupted. Mm. And then the qalb is this aspect of the heart where it is the center of the human being. And this is mm. this is what I think p p potentially is fundamentally different than a uh, mm. Western notion of psychology is that we understand that the the qalb, the heart, being the center of the human being means that the in intellect and the thinking is an aspect of the human being, but it's not the primary uh, heart of the consciousness or identity of the human being. That, that, that's one of the things I found uh, in talking to non-Muslims, Westerners, about uh, the Islamic understanding of the heart, and, and many traditional societies use similar kinds of language. That, that the heart uh, can can be blinded, uh, or the, the heart, hearts can understand. And they say, well, "What is this? What is this language? What is language?" That the heart is is just a physical organ that pumps blood around our bodies. And and there's this very materialist understanding of of, of what we are uh, as as a species. And I'm just reminded of a, a quote from the Quran here: uh, "Have these people not travelled through the land with hearts to understand and ears to hear? It yes. is not people's eyes that are blind, but their hearts within their breasts." So the heart is not just almost like a cognitive faculty as a spiritual right. organ, but also it has a location, uh, interestingly, within their breast, presumably within the, the right. root, which to be very physical for a second. So it's similar to the heart, but not the same as the heart, located in the same area. But it has a much more elevated spiritual function mm -hmm. than the mere physical organ that in the West we just tend to assume is the heart. Yes, this is a really important point in that what what by by pointing us to the the chest mm. it's locating like you said where is the soul it's locating the soul or the the core of the human being and its ability to perceive in a physical location in the body mm. and so it's a really different notion of psychology being sort of this only mental processes where the body is sort of just a casing for the soul. And we often think of ourselves as, uh, it's almost like we, we operate as these from the head up, you know, and the, the, the rest of our body is, is relatively in, um, uh, disconnected from our sense of self. And what mm -hmm. this is doing is when, it, when, when the Quran is referencing in their chests, do they not have hearts with which they perceive? The, the term used is, is yakiluna. And so this is a, a, a form of akal, the, mm -hmm. the Arabic word akal. And so we, we use, we talk about intelligence or intellect, and we do have rational thought and we do have logic. And that is in, in ways connected to our, our mental capacity in, in the brain. But then we, also have it's not one or the other it's in addition to we have the ability to see things as they are mm. so whereas our logic is sort of deducing based on data and trying to understand something from a removed place of can i try to put together based on this data to come up with a an answer versus where when we're talking about when the Quran is referencing, do they not see with their heart? It is mm. this ability to actually perceive what is and almost in this shahid, like as a witness to what is rather than as a thinking or cognitive deducing of possibility. Mm. Yes. And that, that, that actually is something that has a physical location and it is connected to the, uh, to the organ of the heart, right? So, and this is the, I think the beautiful thing is that 
the Islamic paradigm is so much within this realm of Tawheed, right? Mm -hmm. So the notion of oneness is pervades the theological framework that Islam posits. And so mm -hmm. everything from that perspective is interconnected. And so mm -hmm. we don't make a separation between body and soul. And so when we, so something I like that I think makes the most sense when we try to make sense of this mind-body problem, right, that, that mm -hmm. is often talked about in, in philosophy, uh, Mullah Sadra uh, said that the, the soul is a dense manifestation, sorry, that the body is a dense manifestation of the soul in this worldly dimension. Right. And so what it does is it doesn't see it as just a casing for the soul, rather, mm. but rather it um, recognizes that in order to engage the soul and in order to open to this seeing with the heart, one must be embodied. Mm. And, and th this, this strikes me uh, as going against a, a central tenet of kind of the Western tradition, uh, stemming perhaps from Descartes, the famous French philosopher uh, back in the 16th century, the idea that, that uh, the separation between the mind and the body, you know, I think, therefore I am, you know, I am, I am just this cerebral mental uh, awareness, rather than a more holistic understanding of, of the mind and the body together uh, with, with the heart, uh, as having um, an emotional cognitive uh, awareness as well. And and this kind of, uh, you know, the body is just like a machine. Animals are just machines. They're not, for, for Descartes, they were not even sentient beings. Um, right. it, it led to a great, uh, arguably, a great degradation or an impoverishment of our understanding of the world. Uh, and this is something that um, I Islam, uh, and it's not just uh, Muslims, other people have been pushing back against this um, mechanistic understanding of the human beings as well. Yeah, and and when we when we look deeper into instead of I think therefore I am that you know my thoughts define my my experience and my existence and it's sort of contained within that is that when we look at this notion of the the heart having the ability to not just define itself but to actually open to truth and reality mm. and be able to perceive what is, almost like having a, a connection to a, uh, a co God consciousness. Right, right. And what that, what that positions us is the ability to be transcendent, transcending the limitations of the separate self mm. and being able to connect through the the function of the heart being able to perceive it what is it perceiving if it's seeing things as it they are then the perception is seeing that not only that god is one but that we as human beings are servants of god or slaves of god and mm. so that fundamental um, uh, consciousness that we have the ability to uncover to puts us in right balance with the the definition of our existence which is actually, the, sorry the quran's understanding of fitra it's there in the hadith as well that there our, our very nature our human condition is orientated to to god to truth to justice and so on it's not just a tabula rosa a blank slate which again is right. a very popular post-enlightenment western idea that we bring we don't bring anything into the world we're, we're just written upon by our culture our families our education and that produces us but the Islamic understanding is very different. Actually, we, we, we are highly calibrated spiritual, physical beings right from the get-go. Uh, and, and this orientates us, as you say, to God consciousness as well. Yes. And it's, what's, what's really interesting is it's even before from the get-go. Right? I think and this is another fundamental difference in an Islamic psychology versus a Western notion is that we're not just taking from birth to the present moment as the definition of the human being's existence, mm. but we're looking at prenatal and post-mortem, right? Mm. So the, the trajectory of the human being actually started before this life and mm. everything that we're doing and everything that we're moving towards is with the assumption and the knowledge that it will continue after this life. Mm. And mm. when we go 
to this fitra and understanding our natural disposition, what is our natural disposition mm. of the of the ruh, essentially, the, the soul that is unbound by this separate experience, you know, this experience of separateness in this world, is that before we came into these bodies in this dunya, we existed, meaning every soul that has ever and ever will be created by God existed on this plane of alast, right? And so in the Quran, it says, uh, Allah said, Alastu bi rabbikum, am I not your Lord? And all of the souls answered, Bala, shahidna. Certainly we, we witness. Shahidna, we, you know, shahid is, yeah. is very different than we believe or we cognitively recognize from a distant perspective that we're believing, mm -hmm. but it is witnessing reality. So it's a, it's a visceral experiential knowing. Mm -hmm. And what we're knowing is that Allah is one, Allah is our Lord, and that we are slaves of, of God. Mm -hmm. And so then that knowledge is contained within us always, mm -hmm. within the mechanism or the, the aspect of us, the ruh. This, this, this part of ourselves that cannot be um, corrupted. But what happens is when we come into this world, we get veiled from that witnessing mm. and we're suddenly in this separate experience. That's a great, I, I like the way you, you just expressed that. Very, uh, uh, very dramatic. <laughs> Coming into the body is almost being trapped in this corporeal yeah. form. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it's, it's just sort of, we instantly go from seeing seeing things as they are to being being covered over right we're covering mm -hmm. over yes and so then our journey is to uh, i guess for lack of a better term to come back into this witnessing to to connect mm -hmm. back with our fitra but the beautiful thing here is that we actually have the potential in this life to to not just go back but to go forward so mm -hmm. it's not that we're just only coming back into this fitra state of witnessing, but that we have the, the potential of elevating and maximizing our potential. And this is where we have the example of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is the perfected human being that we use as the, the goal to emulate his character, to build towards uh, becoming, you know, going from what we are to what we can become. Mm. I mean, we we find intimations of this um, in the Western tradition. In Plato, for example, uh, the word intimations of immortality, the sense that um, our, our existence in this world is a forgetting. Um, we have perhaps a lively sense of this in our childhood and infancy. As we get older, we lose the sense of where we have come from right. in our pre corporeal life, uh, but that we will go back to it. And is there even there in, in Western philosophy in, in Plato, although it's not these days obviously a, a, a theme that's taken seriously in our materialist dunya scented perspective in the west yeah yeah the um yeah go ahead no i was just going to ask from what you, you mentioned al ghazali obviously he's a, a a very famous proponent of sufism but is there a sense in what sense is is that islamic psychology the same as sufism or does it have a more um what for a better term more scientific more academically grounded theoretical basis or is it just simply sufism mm -hmm. in our modern times yeah that's a, that's a thing that people grapple with and a question that often gets asked and i think you know to answer it in in the way that it's asked is is difficult because it sort of puts it it, it it is grounded in, I think, a misunderstanding of what Sufism is. And then we carry forward with that assumption. And it is sort of a reductionist notion of, of what Sufism is because our relationship to our understanding of and the integration of Sufism within the Ummah currently has been, has changed a lot in the past hundred years. And so... Mm. You know, before a hundred years ago, or within, there was no, there wasn't this sense that Sufism is this, um, is this uh, sort of uh, un, unknown 
strange aspect of, of Islam that may or may not be part of Islam. And, you know, some people have this notion that it is bidah, it's innovation. And, you know, this has really happened at, over time as this has become hidden away and sort of taken out of the mainstream experience of the Muslim mm. community. It used to be that, you know, the, the science of tasawwuf, and I think yeah. this is where maybe we get confused is when we say Sufism, what people are often talking about when they reference that term is all of this uh, notions of tariqa and certain Sufi tariqas and what they do and their practices and then their relationship to a sheikh. And, and that, that's fine. That's, that's one thing. And a lot of that has been uh, cultural manifestations in different places. And that's really like tariqa. But then tasawwuf is, was a science. It's really a, the science of the soul, the mm -hmm. science of the inner reality, the haqiqa. And it is, it was always sort of accepted and understood that you couldn't really understand fiqh without understanding tasawwuf. And you couldn't understand tasawwuf without understanding fiqh. And mm -hmm. the reality of that is because that the sharia, the exoteric aspect of the practices of Islam and the theological uh, uh, aspects of it is not separate from the haqiqa, the inner reality and that you can't have one without the other. Mm. And, and what we tend to do, and this is a lot from this post maybe modernity and you know maybe even being influenced by this Cartesian thought and the Renaissance of we start to look at things in this material detached mm. way. And so then we're looking at just the Sharia, just the outer form of things, the exoteric. And what happens is we become, everything becomes sort of transactional in our relationship to Islam versus we miss out on the transformational aspect. And I think what Sufism is, or what Tasawwuf is, is that inner transformational reality of understanding what Allah has set out for the Muslim to do, and all of these external behaviors that we're supposed to do, things we're supposed to believe, ways we're supposed to orient, that those are um, in order to evoke transformation to change what is within ourselves mm. and and i think it's it's it would be very difficult to think of a psychology or an islamic psychology that doesn't involve the esoteric doesn't involve the inner reality of things because by essence that's kind of what we're talking about when we're talking about the study of the soul and the the changing what is within oneself in that journey of the soul it is all about the inner and it's all about this unseen process of transformation. And I think that is what Sufism or Tasawwuf is a, is a legacy and a treasure trove of, of wisdom, practice and understanding for just that uh, okay. inner work. Okay, well, it's like a different question, and I, I'm, I'm a bit perplexed to know what the answer can be. I, I mean, what can a contemporary Western psychology learn from Islamic psychology? Because so far you've rooted it in, in explicitly Islamic, Islamic paradigm. You, you've mentioned our existence before our corporeal existence on earth, we're bearing witness before God, and after our death, you know, we will return to God and so on. So... D d does Western psychology have to convert to Islam basically to benefit yeah. from it? Or is there are other aspects of it that can yeah. enrich um, the contemporary Western psychology? Uh, I mean, yeah. how, how, do you, how do you answer that kind of question? I mean, may maybe how I answer it would be different than others because I think it can be a contentious thing to, to but I, I very, very much do believe that um, there is quite a lot that the Western, psycho Western psychology can take from and learn from Islam, regardless of whether uh, the, a person becomes Muslim or not. I mean, mm -hmm. is because um, when, from my experience as a practitioner and being trained in Western psychology, there's a lot that has been developed that is really good and is really useful and is in many ways really aligned with an Islamic paradigm. Mm -hmm. And what you tend to find is that people 
these techniques or these uh, approaches to a, a psychology which are rooted in in a theological or theoretical orientation to how we understand the human being is that it is almost in this black box right mm. where it only because we're only dealing with um from birth to right now and w- without anything else and without the unseen sort of reality what you're what you're finding is that people are still coming up against those questions and those realities of mm. meaning and purpose and who am i really and what am i here for but then also on a on a practical level people tend to um come up against their difficulties their tribulations their psychological imbalances they can open to them they can unpack them they can understand them and then what tends to happen is you find people cycling back so what they're doing more is coping rather than transforming and transcending right right and so what regardless of the theological things there are certain approaches to psychology that if people experience and i have the i have direct experience because i've worked with non-muslims and i would say that i do islamic psychology but i don't use islamic term arabic terms and i'm not trying to get them to be muslim i'm mm. simply dealing with the human being in a way that's opening to the heart rather than just dealing with thoughts right and so i'm i'm guiding them to their chest mm getting them to get in touch with the emotional material that exists physically in this place just like when we get anxiety our chest caves in you know and then we get constricted so i'm getting them to breathe expand their chest open to the emotional material that's here right and then trying to in the while we're uncovering to these um pain and and difficulty from maybe past experiences we are um putting in some aspect some whatever makes sense to them of of connecting to something beyond themselves right and and um finding a an uncovering to the truth to be able to 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 witnessing what's actually at the core of what has been covered up Mm. And so what happens is people have their own make their own sense of god or you know some people say the universe or some people but most people even people who say that they're atheists when you speak to them at best they're most usually agnostic yes um and they have they they don't like the way that the language that has been used around religion and god because they perceive it as gods like a god that is acting up within its it, within creation and so i think there's a lot of education of just understanding what god is even mm-hmm. for muslims to be honest mm-hmm. and then the language becomes less important and people are tapping into actually their own sense of fitra right and there's a lot that can be worked with within people's own experience and the way that they make sense of that own experience of that experience that can then shift their uh their orientation to the heart and mm. to transformation and transcending problems rather than just coping with them fascinating now if people wanted to take this further uh what resources are, are there for us to access maybe videos or books and so on how, how how can we take the next step to learn more about islamic psychology so there is a uh there's the international association of islamic psychology mm-hmm. uh it's uh, islamicpsychology.org mm-hmm. and there's quite a lot of information on about what is like what is islamic psychology but then there's also a page on uh publications and so yeah. there's books and articles so there's plenty of reading where somebody could get into uh learning more uh and then also we at cambridge muslim college we last year started a diploma in islamic psychology so you can do a one year diploma and it is really unpacking from the from the beginning historically where uh the 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 classical early scholars that contributed to the to this field understanding all of the the roots and foundations from the islamic theologies taught by scholars of epist- of islamic epistemology and kalam wow. and, um and really going deep into building from the ground up an understanding of an indigenous approach to islamic psychology 
Uh, and so, and then from that, we also do, we're starting to do more sort of public facing for people that don't want to dive that deep into a diploma. Um, we do, we do um, talks. And then uh, I have a lot of articles and videos, uh, on, videos on YouTube that, right. that explain the model of the soul, that explain Islamic psychology, that actually uh, a couple Ramadans ago, I did a program called Midnight Moments, and it's much more practical for the lay person to actually implement some of these uh, approaches in our daily life. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll link to these, I'm taking notes, I'll link to these in the description below so people can uh, investigate further. I mean, you, you touched briefly on the on the Cambridge Muslim College and the diploma there, but you're actually the new principal of the Cambridge Muslim College, alhamdulillah. Um, how do you see the future of, of this incredible institution uh, in the future? What, 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 where is it going? What, I mean, briefly, what is it about? Well, what's its raison d'etre, if you like? And where do you see it going in the future? So the college, it's been, we're in our 12th year, and mm. the, the mission of the college, the purpose of it is to um, have an institution that engages both the Islamic tradition in the, in the traditional sense of scholar, Islamic scholarship and the sort of best of that world that we have from our legacies of, from Baghdad and Syria and Damascus and, and really... Um, not only bringing that to Cambridge, this, this university city that is sort of um, this legacy of Western academia, but having the, our approach to Islamic studies be integrated with an understanding with contemporary issues and Western academia. And right. so what we're trying to do is really equip young leaders um, it, to not only understand the tradition like fiqh and kalam and Qurans and hadith, which they study, but then they're also understanding Western philosophy and theories of science and contemporary issues and psychology and really to be able to not only speak to today's people, but to grapple with some of these really difficult issues of our contemporary time and understand that the tradition um, is a living tradition. It is something that is supposed to be revived and uh, re-understood in every uh, day and age. Not that we change it, but mm -hmm. that we, you know, what tradition, you know, what we, off, what Sheikh Abdul Hakim, who has founded the college, often says is we, what we're doing is more traditional than the traditionalists. <laughs> Mm -hmm. In the sense that, you know, the, the, the original uh, scholars of Islam were always engaged with the contemporary thought of the time and really um, were able to integrate it, always using the Quran as the, as the Furqan, as the criterion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so this is, so we have programs, we have a BA in Islamic studies, which is a three-year okay. in-person program where, where the students are learning traditional, uh, traditional curriculum of Islamic studies based on like what you would find at Al-Azhar, but integrated with these Western academic uh, uh, studies. So the, then, these, courses are, sorry, these courses are open to the public, to, to, to the, they're not just to imams and uh, future. No. Uh, they, they are for They're everyone. open to the public. You apply, you get a BA. Right. Some of our students had a background in economics before, or they were GPs right. or, um, and then we also, so that's, that's a BA program. It's three yep. years. And then we have a one year, diploma that is for imams, that is for people who have graduated or finished their studies in like Dar al -Alum or a madrasa. Mm. And then this program is more focused on the, the contextual studies of Western intellectual thought, because they already have the foundation of the Islamic uh, sciences. Mm. And then we also have a, this online diploma in Islamic psychology, which I mentioned. Extraordinary. Uh, very, very exciting I, I, indeed. I, I think it's the, the only one of its kind in, in Britain. And, and I, I was speaking to someone just yesterday from uh, Belgium, actually. He, he's a, a convert himself. Um, and um, he, he said there was nothing like that in Belgium at all. I mean, not that Belgium, I'm not singling out that country, but it, it seems that it's pioneering, is what I'm trying to say here, uh, and that many other countries hopefully might take um, inspiration from this uh, and, and maybe uh, adopt some of the best practices of, of the college. And this will enrich an Islamic uh, European or Western discourse, elevating it above um, 
some other kinds of discourse that we see today and refining our understanding of, of knowledge uh, in a way that's not um, hostile. It's not like rejection to the West. It's not just saying haram or, or this is unacceptable. Right. But 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 seeing the but drawing on the strengths because there are strengths within the Western tradition um, yes. and, and things to learn as well as things to avoid as well perhaps right and it's engaging in in honest authentic dialogue that uh, mm. that honors both sides and that really gives gives critical thought to to that process of dialogue. Mm. Mm. Okay, well, that's what, perhaps we'll, we'll, we'll leave it there. I, I do appreciate you, your time, uh, Dr. Abzal. Thank you very much indeed. As I say, you are the, the principal of the Cambridge uh, Muslim College. Uh, if you don't know about it, I'll link to that as well. Do, do check it out. Um, it, it's an incredible institution, as you say, founded by uh, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad, otherwise known as Tim Winter, of course. He's a, an English convert to Islam, uh, known as a great scholar at Cambridge University, but he has now this uh, a related institution in the same city of Cambridge. So um, thank you very much, sir, for your time. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Nice to be with you. Thank you.